Hello and welcome to another episode of Through an Opaque Lens with me, Niall Murphy, coming at you on the 2nd of September 2024. Where has the year gone? It's gone so far, so fast, hasn't it? Before I get on to um, the subjects I like to cover, of course, the, the more UK-centric subjects I like to cover, I've got to talk about Brazil. Now, if you'd have asked me a little while ago, what was Brazil known for? It was known for its sexy laid days. It was known for carnival. It was known for being this kind of sun, sea, sand, surf place. This exotic land, of Rio de Janeiro with its statue and that amazing view up on the hills. It was known for um, its uh, extension of Portuguese culture and being to Portugal what the United States is towards the UK. And um, I grew up thinking of Brazil as this uh, amazing exotic place. Right. However, recently it's become known for becoming a grim, dystopian hellhole of a place with the second in line or the second most powerful person there, now a bloke called Alexandra Giamorais, I think his name is pronounced. I might be butchering it slightly, but he looks like Voldemort from a Harry Potter movies. So he looks like a proper villain and of course, um, you know, whereas uh, you've got Klaus Schwab, who also looks like Blofeld from Bond, you know. Uh, it kind of makes me think that now that we've got our sinister dictator that we have in the UK, we're even crap at that. We've got one that looks like an NPC. Oh, come back to that later. Anyway, but one of my favourite pictures I got of this uh, Alexandra from um, the, the Supreme Court judge was uh, a picture that was taken with a goose neck microphone meticulously placed in front of him that makes him look like he's got a Hitler moustache and I thought yeah why not share that. So he now has banned X Twitter in um, Brazil and um, Elon Musk has taken him on in the same way he took on Keir Starmer. Elon Musk has become the rogue billionaire who bloody stands up to in his cheeky two dictators and of course you know as you know recently Pavel Durov the uh, man who runs Telegram and um, was arrested in France um, for and um, put in prison, I think. But they let him out and just let him on, you know, how can I say? He's stuck in France, but they let him out of prison because the UAE, and of course, um, Pavel became uh, a citizen of the UAE, um, decided that they were no longer going to um, buy uh, weapons off of France uh, or said, if you don't let him out, we won't buy weapons off you. So France would have lost 10 billion euros worth of money there. So they let him out, but he's still apparently, you know, how can I say, under house arrest or under France arrest, but he's no longer banged up, right? And of course, uh, you know, they're talking about how this could be, because they've managed to arrest Pavel Durov, this could be a reason for why they could hunt down and arrest Elon Musk. What, for speaking up for free speech? I mean, it's just ridiculous, isn't it? So we end up in this world which has become totalitarian, as you know, and now if you are in Brazil and if you're caught using a VPN to access X in Brazil, um, what well, they want to find, like, was it up to $9,000 per day for if they catch you using X over there? It's just insane, isn't it? How the hell did this happen? And of course, you know, are any countries in Europe or America going and saying, this is against human rights, this is against human freedom, we can't allow this. No, they're not. They're just silent on it. And Elon Musk is one of the only people out there who, um, you know, with money and with influence complaining about it, and yet they're making him out to be a far-right Nazi. How the hell did the world come to this? You see, this is what I say. If you want to see how the world has changed in the last 25 years, uh, I'd recommend, again, going back to um, documentaries made by Adam Curtis. I was watching the Adam Curtis documentary, The Power of Nightmares, last night, because um, he'd done a lot of uh, these documentaries during the time of the War on Terror. And um, if you want a wider historical context to how we end up in a situation like this, but then a flippening happens as well, that will give you a good um, historical context. You see, what happened was, there was a time when the political right in America, and the Christian right in particular, was extremely puritanical, and um, the left were the rebels. But somehow, a 180 degree flipping happened. Right? But uh, what it was is that, in the aftermath of the Cold War, America had convinced itself that it had won the Cold War. Technically it hadn't. Technically what happened is that the, uh, you know, the Soviet Empire just collapsed under its own weight because it couldn't work anymore. 
because um, that's what happens. Uh, and of course, you know, America and the Western world inherited this world. The Iron Curtain came down, and a lot of Eastern European countries, after rebelling against uh, the, you know, their dictators that they had, which were extensions of the Soviet bloc, um, ended up becoming democratic countries. So America thought, well, if this can happen, we can bring our instant imperial democracy to uh, the Arab world and other countries in the world. And of course, that didn't work out very well at all. That utterly failed. And now we're in this time in the aftermath of that where the liberalism, if you like, that the, um, r the people on the right back in the time when uh, they were very puritanical, well, it's turned the other way around. Now the liberal order has control, uh, the lefties have the power, and the people on the right are the counterculture. But it's, like, it's a flippening that's so subtle that a lot of people can't see it. Now, if I were to go back in time 25 years, 35 years, I probably would be more on the side of the left than I am now, and less on the side of the right. I'm even from a relatively agnostic and apolitical stance that I would be coming from. Uh, but my position, me, I haven't changed. My ideological position hasn't changed much. My thing is that whoever is the counterculture, whoever are the dissident class, whoever they are, are the people that I always end up siding with. Um, ideology doesn't really come into it much for me. I'm quite an ideological agnostic in that way, political agnostic. I tend not to use the word anarchist these days because I kind of feel that agnostic actually suits me better. Right? But I never thought I would see the day where things like this are happening. The funny thing about it, of course, is that, um, what's his name, Voldemort, Alexandra Voldemort in uh, Brazil, now wants to, uh, has actually suggested, and I saw this on X earlier today, that he wants to actually remove, expunge, delete the phrase illegal immigrant from, or illegal immigration entirely, from the Brazilian Portuguese language and the English language on the internet outside of that as well. Like it's a phrase that don't exist, a contraband phrase you could say. That's what he wants to do now. The funny thing about it is that he just seems to me like Keir Starmer on steroids, you know, uh, and that's the trouble. So, we see how this goes with Elon Musk. Um, now, what I also find interesting is the fact that, look, people of many different mentalities, whether you're in uh, conspiracies, whether you're into the, you know, the, what you would call it, the, the liberal lefty order, whether you're on the right, whether you're Christian, whether you're in too many conspiracy rabbit holes or whatever, people have become very ossified in the way that they think about this stuff. Where with me, I'm trying to think of all this stuff in a more big picture perspective. You see, I don't care whether people are on the left or on the right. If they've ended up dissidents, they're dissidents. If people are just echoing and paying lip service to the orthodoxy when the world is becoming more tyrannical, <laughs> irrespective of whether they're on the left or the right, it doesn't matter. It's and then on the other side, you've got the dissident class. Again, it doesn't matter whether they're on the left or whether they're on the right. The bigger picture is, if we are going into a world that has become more authoritarian and we have, um, you know, you have these people, you have the useful idiots, of course you can be on both sides, you can have the authoritarians and the people who pay lip service to the authoritarian, you can have the people who are asleep who don't know that they've gone into an authoritarian world and haven't woken up yet, and then you have the dissidents. And to me, these are the only demarcation lines that you need. Now, of course, um, I also uh, saw something, I think I saw this in the, it, it, was, a, it was one of those headlines that I saw in the uh, New York Times, I don't know if I can actually find it and put it on the screen, doesn't matter whether I do or not in post-production, but they were actually um, you know, talking about whether the First Amendment or the First or Second Amendments in the US were actually dangerous and whether they need to be got rid of. And you know that if Harris wins, um, she probably will try to challenge those two amendments, which will then allow the United States to lose its freedom of speech in the same way that the UK is losing it, Canada's losing it, a lot of Europe is losing it, and oh, oh, Brazil oh, has definitely lost it. So you see what I mean? This is uh, really bad, the way these ideas are propagating. And of course it appears that there's two rogue billionaires, because you've got Elon Musk and you've got Donald Trump. Now, a lot of people don't like Elon Musk or Donald Trump. 
A lot of people on the left have Donald Trump derangement syndrome, and a lot of conspiracy theories believe that Elon Musk is also evil for whatever reasons. But I'm not really interested in taking a side one way or the other. What I do see is that when the world gets to the state that it's in at the moment, you have a lot of people who are at the top who have the most money or whatever, who have the most influence, but then you have rogue people within that who break off and become the opposite of that. That's an interesting time in history to look out for because then you realise that rather there being one direction that the world can go in, there are now two directions that the world can go in. And this, to me, might not be the most ideal scenario, but it is, in my opinion, an improvement because suddenly there are two paths ahead of us. And one of them, um, we know yeah, where that's leading. The other one, well, that could be a trap too, but there's more reason to be optimistic if we go down that path. And I personally think that's the way that people really should look at the world at the moment. But there are two paths you can go by, but in the long run, there's still time to change your road you're on, as um, Led Zeppelin once said, you know. And let's hope that enough people find, the, you know, get the time to change your road they're on before it's too late, right? Anyway, um, here's something I actually posted um, on X myself, and um, this was a reply to, uh, this was a reply rather than a post. But I, I had to um, put this up here and I have to read it because it's one of the best things I think I've ever said. If everyone who is not in the government stopped hating each other, this would be the ultimate example of malicious compliance. The whole country could unite with one common adversary who hates the people and it would not be what the government expected. I spoke about malicious compliance two videos ago, right? And um, we could say that the Starmer administration in the UK has um, already uh, drawn a couple of lines in the sand. And of course, I could just uh, well, comply with those lines in the sand in my own way that they don't expect to say, OK, they don't want me to incite hatred or violence or any of that stuff. Um, they want me to um, only incite love and unity and good things and fluffy things. So here I go. It's clear to me that there are a lot of people in the UK of all demographics, of all walks of life, of all political persuasions, whether they be on the left, the middle or the right, whether they be of uh, Muslim origin or whether they be Sikh or Hindu, whether they be Christian, whether they be atheist, whether they be pagan. It's clear to me that there are a lot of people who are of all of these groups, all these ethnic groups, all these demographic groups, whatever, who are capable of waking up and seeing what, that they have been played and are waking up to the reality that, no, I don't want to be played anymore. And we could say that there's enough people awake in all of these groups for us to unite all the disparate tribes. I would say, of course, being as I'm somewhat of an atypical anywhere rather than somewhere, but not a typical anywhere, um, I'm someone who's internationalized from the fact that I always felt like a misfit in the UK anyway. I like to say I was born cancelled, so as a result of me being born cancelled and, you know, always being a, a non-conformist and a misfit within English society, that, um, you know, I, I just feel like I just go anywhere else, go everywhere else, it doesn't matter where I end up, because I ended up being detached. Now, I know that there's a lot of people who want to save the UK, and I know there's a lot of people who, um, you know, uh, are nationalists, but are not far right. And this is one of the reasons why I have an issue with um, Keir Starmer, um, you know, talking about the far right, talking about nationalism, talking about populism, even having the bloody audacity to say that people have been sold snake oil. Like, people don't have enough agency, they don't have enough discernment skills, they don't have enough of the ability to think for themselves, to do their own research, to come to their own conclusions about something, to then realise that, no, actually, we don't want you to be our managerial class, right? This is the thing, we don't want you to be our managerial class. We can actually work shit out for ourselves. You do not frame the debate here. We're far more sophisticated in the way that we think that you think we are. We're not what you say we are, and we'll work it out for ourselves, actually. Thank you very much. And we can do so without, um, you know, without uh, inciting, inciting anything bad, without being hateful. We can do that, right? And so the conclusion I come to is that I don't, on an individual to individual basis, you can be from anywhere, you can be from any demographic, you can believe what you want to believe, but if you are awake enough to realise that all the tribes have to find a way of uniting, that there has to be a common consensus between everyone who is in the UK, 
And what we have to do is to work out how the hell we're going to get along, because we have to get along. It is too late for the UK to be anything other than a multicultural society. So individuals within um, the UK, the most intelligent, the most awake, the most discerning, um, have to find a way of being able to live with each other. Now, no one can say that that's a bad thing, could they? But it's the best thing that anyone could possibly do. We're able to be able to bang the world to rights, and we have to find a way of being able to get on with each other, and then we have to find a way of being able, as individuals, as people, to talk to as many people and say that, no, we can learn to live with each other, we just have to try. There are obstacles. So therefore, these so-called <laughs> community leaders, right? Well, you know, a good example is there's this organisation, um, I was watching Silky Carlo from Big Brother Watch, and she was in Peckham, and they were doing something about uh, uh, facial recognition CCTV police vans going through Peckham, right? And she was talking to this uh, black bloke who was uh, British, probably of Jamaican origin himself, and um, they set up this group uh, on the street. They called themselves Street Fathers. Now, I know this is quite a cheesy name for anything, but they are out there on the street trying to find ways of getting, you know, young boys, if you like, of ethnic uh, minority groups in uh, the UK, in, in places like Peckham in South London, and trying to encourage them to better themselves and to become better men. And I think that, you know, people like that, if they do a good job of it, these people are admirable, honourable for doing what they're doing. So we, are, we now know that you know, people can take it into their own hands to form groups, to find ways of being able to get their own demographics, whoever they are, and encourage them to be more responsible and better people. And if I met this bloke, we'd probably get on like house on fire. I'd say, good on you, mate. And I'd ask him what he was doing, what good are you bringing to the community? And I'd be interested. In fact, you know, maybe I, I should find out more about them, you know. Maybe I could interview someone. I can't promise I will, but it's something I would like to look into. And I say that, you know, if lots of people were able to start these community groups and say, OK, we have to find a way of being able to make our own groups, our own demographics, irrespective of who they are, able to become better, more responsible people, and find ways of getting all these different groups of people to then talk to each other and then get them all to integrate and then get them to integrate and as well with the indigenous people, the Anglo-Saxons. I mean, that doesn't include me. Technically, I'm part of the oh, no Irish, no blacks, no dogs diaspora myself, being a Gael, not an Anglo-Saxon, right? But the most important thing I would say, as a white and as an ethnic minority in the UK, having a third party perspective is that I think it would be great if somehow you could get all the people who are being divided off against each other, being played off against each other, to talk to each other. And, of course, for the communities, the more responsible members of all the communities, to uh, encourage each other to be responsible. And then we could all get together down the pub and bang the world to rights in a beer garden where you can't smoke anymore. Because I personally honestly think that um, Keir Starmer, by bringing in these rules, in fact, um, I've got to show you a meme. This is like a Monty Python style meme. I'll get back to what I was saying, but as you can see, there's Michael Palin saying, Inspector, Inspector, I was just having a smoke outside a pub when a man stabbed me in the stomach and stole my watch. And John Cleese as the copper say, Smoking outside a pub, you say? Yeah. The thing is, right, that we know that Keir Starmer doesn't like the white working classes and doesn't really want people who are of the so-called lower orders, the peasants, to be able to meet each other and talk to each other and bang the world to rights. I also know that he's bloody obsessed with the far right and racism and hate and incitement and all of that. So, in my endeavours of malicious compliance, I'm trying to encourage all of the demographics that there are in the UK, whether you're Muslim, whether you're Sikh, whether you're Hindu, whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're brown, whether you're Christian, whether you're atheist, whether you're pagan, talk to each other. If everyone spoke to each other and say, right, we've got to find a way of uniting the tribes. We all say, in England, we've got to find a way of uniting the tribes. We don't need the government or the state to intervene, but we can talk to each other and we can find a way of coming to some peaceful consensus. And we should try to talk about things, even if they're taboo, but with the intention of bringing unity and, um, and find a way of being able to bring peace out between us all because that's what you need. 
you know, more jaw jaw, less war war. And that was an idea that came to me, um, you know, the other day. Because I think that's really one of the only things that we can do, right? Uh, that's one of the best ways that we can rebel against the, the, the present dividers and rulers within the framework of something they haven't told us that is illegal yet, right? In the meantime, I was wondering, am I the only person who saw this? Um, Carl Benjamin was talking about this on the Lotus Eaters, and he actually said that Keir Starmer actually physically looks like an NPC meme. Now, I'd already come to this conclusion, so um, here he is, Keir Starmer as an M NPC meme, and he's instantly recognisable as Keir Starmer, even with that NPC face, isn't he? There you go. Right, well, I don't think there's any problem with satire yet. So I cooked together this They Live meme, because I thought They Live, the John Carpenter film, right, is actually a really good way of satirising everything. So uh, I tried to post this on Facebook, but it wouldn't let me. It told me in its community guidelines that it might um, uh, be considered to be incitement. Incitement to what? To make people laugh. It's not incitement to hatred. I mean, there's no, no one says anything, and it's just a piss take out of uh, the government based on the film They Live. I thought it was actually quite funny. They haven't banned satire as far as I know. They haven't banned satire. And like I say, all I want to do is make people laugh. All I want to do is make people, um, you know, find a way of getting uh, together and having good conversations. What's wrong with that? I don't see what's wrong with that. So, have a butchers at this. See you at the other end. Right, well, I hope you like that. Uh, <laughs> now, I don't want to put it on Facebook because after he gave me that warning, I thought, oh, shit, you know what they're going to do? <laughs> I can end up in the crosshairs. To hell with it, though, man. All I do is just put this video up and not monetize it on YouTube and on Rumble and uh, post a link. And then we see how we go from there. I, didn't, I thought that was actually quite harmless and quite amusing myself, didn't you? Right, yeah? So, anyway, um, I found a clip by Christopher Hitchens that I, I thought this was brilliant. Now, a lot of people like or dislike Christopher Hitchens, but the thing is, whether you like these people or whether you don't, incidentally, before I carry on, I'm gonna have a fag, because out here, you can smoke in bars. I know a free country when I'm in one, I'll tell you. Right, anyway, uh, what was I say? Yeah, so Christopher Hitchens, um, you know, was actually uh, referring to the classics. And um, he was far much more of an intellectually astute man than myself, and a far posher voice than me. And he was talking about freedom of speech, I think this was years ago, in the mid 2000s. So have a look at this clip. I think anyone who wants to say anything abusive about or to me is quite free to do so. And welcome, in fact, at their own risk. <laughs> And, um, but before they do that, they must have taken, as I'm sure we all should, a short refresher course in the classic texts on this matter, which are John Milton's Areopagitica, Areopagitica being the great hill of Athens for discussion and free expression, um, Thomas Paine's introduction to the Age of Reason, and I would say a John Stuart Mill's essay on liberty, in which it is variously said, I'll, I'll, I'll be very daring and summarize all three of these great gentleman of the great tradition of especially English liberty um, in one go. What they say is, it's not just the right of the person who speaks to be heard. It is the right of everyone in the audience to listen and to hear. And every time you silence somebody, you make yourself a prisoner of your own action because you deny yourself the right to hear something. In other words, your own right to hear and be exposed is as much involved in all these cases as is the right of the other to voice his or her view. Indeed, as John Stuart Mill said, if all in society were agreed on the truth and beauty and value of one proposition, all except one person 
it will be most important, in fact, it would become even more important that that one heretic be heard because we would still benefit from his perhaps outrageous or appalling view. In more modern times, this has been put, I think, best by a personal heroine of mine, Rosa Luxemburg, who said that the freedom of speech is meaningless unless it means the freedom of the person who thinks differently. And this is the thing, being able to be in a minority of one. If everyone um, agrees uh, that, yes, we all trust the government, we all agree with what the government said, and that one person in the whole world, in the whole universe, says, no, I disagree, everyone should listen to him to find out why. Because, yes, free speech is very, very important, and um, this is something that is dying in the world. Um, I don't know why they're so scared of free speech now. Well, I kind of do know why, shall I say, because I grew up in a time, a very interesting time, and, you know, when you do, this time that we're in at the moment is a time of short epochs, and you know what that means? It means, basically, that you can get to the age of 53, which is what I am now, and compared to other eras in history, it's kind of like being 530. I feel like I've been through so many historical epochs, right? You see, I, I was born, and when I was born, right up to the time when I was 18 years old, I was living in a completely different historical epoch. It was post-World War II, and it was at peak Cold War paranoia. This was a time when, you know, uh, someone was going to press the big threatening red button and we all be brown bread in three minutes, right? That was that time, and uh, you kind of got used to, uh, you know, rock stars saying, we want to be the band everyone's dancing to when the bomb goes off, you know? I think Duran Duran were famous for saying that. And, um, you know, Morrissey was saying, you know, well, if it's not love, it's the bomb, the bomb, the bomb, the bomb that will keep us together, right? And then there was that Dancing With Tears In My Eyes, the song about the last three minutes um, before the world ends, you know, by Ultravox. And of course, there was Two Tribes by Frankie Goes to Hollywood, where the, if any member of the family should die while in the shelter, put them outside, remember? And so this was the first 18 years of my life. The world was gonna end in three minutes, but those three minutes lasted 18 years, and God, we're still here. <laughs> the ultimate psyop that was, the war breaks out and no one turns up thing, right? So this is the world I grew up in. And then we had this time, of course, where everyone had to pretend the world was nice and peace and democracy had come to us right up until 9-11. The post-Cold War pre-9-11 time was a very interesting time indeed. But of course, uh, during that time, that's when the internet came out. And then, you know, within the first decade of the internet coming out, the democratisation of information came out, bringing us to the time where we have social media now. And the problem um, that, you know, the commies, as they're reinventing themselves in this modern age that we're in at the moment, is that they can't bear the idea of us, you know, using social media, using YouTube channels, using, just basically, they can't bear the idea of us talking to each other. Uh, they can't bear the idea of them not having monopoly over the narrative, the message. They don't like the idea that so many of us are talking to each other and saying, well, actually, I don't agree with that, you know? This is not a world I want to live in. And so, as a result, they're really coming down like a ton of bricks on everyone and trying to make it illegal. Now, of course, in this recent time, I've gone out of my way to say, okay, I'm not spreading hate, because um, I'm, you know, that's not really, I do not want to be destructive. It's one of my own morals or ethics on this channel is that I don't like to make videos if I'm feeling negative. I like to be positive because I think, well, that's very important. Um, you know, I might have bad moods, I might have depression, bouts of paranoia and all of that thing. But when I'm on camera, the idea for me is that I do not want to spread negativity because, you know, it has implications. Now, this is a conclusion that I've come to of my own, from my own conclusion, don't need governments to do my thinking for you, especially when, uh, you know, I kind of look at the present administration in the UK and uh, suspect that the average IQ of all of these people is lower than mine, you know, no, thank you very much. No, I'm not going to lower my intelligence to have you do my thinking for me, thank you very much. You know, I'm capable of doing my own thinking, my own discerning, and, um, 
you know, my ultimate goal really is common decency, um, individual freedom, common decency, and being an exemplar, I try to be good. I haven't always succeeded, but you know, there comes a time when you have to think, okay, we've got to try to be good. We've got to try to have a good, positive influence in whatever way we can. You know, there are a lot of people out there that I think of that are dubious, um, you know, that I'm somewhat ambivalent to, but they're, maybe they're half right about half of the stuff, but maybe at the same time they are negative influences too in the world. But I also look at the mainstream media and I, I, can't, I can't watch any of it, I can't listen to any of it, because automatically it's like, you know, you know it's going to be predictable, you know, that's the thing. So that's, that's really what I'm thinking. So um, I'm at that point now where I'm thinking that um, whatever we do, yes, don't spread hate, don't incite negative things, but at the same time, within those limited parameters that they've given us, it's still possible with positive messages to encourage people to think freely, think for themselves, be their own person, identify them themselves as sovereign entities, and when it comes to what we would think of in, like, you know, in the, the what I call it, legacy brand countries, formerly known as free countries, mm -hmm. the idea of political individualism, freedom, and the understanding of the rule of law and due process, you know, i.e., the one commandment, don't be a see you next Tuesday, you know, um, be your, you've got, you have your individual rights as an individual that were basically God-given, or if you're an atheist, given to you by the universe, right? Um, you don't need to go to governments to beg, please, can I have these rights? Because they're not rights if they're dished out by governments. They're privileges with caveats and conditions attached, right? And um, the whole idea of rights is that you have the right to be free, to do what you like, and say what you like, up to a certain point, but, as soon, uh, but, but your rights end as someone else's rights your rights end and other individuals' rights. So, for instance, freedom of speech, um, we all know if you're decent, would, would, um, you know, would be limited at telling someone else to hit another person because then that uh, impacts on their freedom. And that's just basic common decency, right? That everyone with a brain should be able to work that out. So, fair enough. You should be able to voice whatever opinions that you have. And of course, you know, when it comes to incitement to destructive things and you've been directly, irrevocably, irrevocably responsible for someone else's destruction, or slander or libel where you say something that actually actively ruins the reputation of someone else, then you know, that's where common decency comes in. So the combination of freedom of speech and common decency, who should have a problem with that? who are only a control freak, only a deranged power crazy person. And the problem is every now and then, you get to a point, history shows, because it's all swings and roundabouts, we get to a point where those with power are the sort of people you wouldn't want to give power to. This is for the same reasons that you wouldn't want to give an unruly seven-year-old kid a jerry can of petrol and a box of matches, right? Because not only would they kill themselves, they'd burn the house down, probably burn the street down too, right? And um, so there are certain people who shouldn't have power, but every now and then they get power, and that's the problem. And how can we deal with this now? How can we deal with this situation? We have to be civilised, we have to be exemplars, we have to act with common decency, we have to be good people. And we have to um, say, okay, I don't want to have a destructive or detrimental effect on other people, but people have to have the right to have conversations. Because if conversation is restricted and we only have state-sanctioned opinions and state-sanctioned conversations, then it's like George Orwell. Oh, incidentally, here's a picture of George Orwell reading about 2024. Yes. We do not want to be living in a world that's like a boot in the face of mankind forever and ever, do we? No. Our ancestors died um, for and died to prevent this from happening. And, you know, there's the phrase, never forget. But then people forget. And that's the trouble. So what can we do? 
we've just got to be able to find a way of being able to have conversations. We've just got to be able to find a way of being able to get um, our message out there. And we've got to make sure that our message is benign, benevolent and inspiring as well, in a good way, in a positive way. And if there has to be a little bit of cheeky political satire, what's wrong with that? As far as I am concerned, from the country I come from, from the culture I come from, satire is just as much part of that as rock and roll is. And it's just as much part of that as the Magna Carta, the rule of law, due process, queuing, you know, all of those things, right? It's just as much part of that as anything else. Because, as I say, they might not be like, you know, politicians might not like being laughed at, right? But at the same time as them not being laughed at, you know, I mean, how can you not? They are fair game as far as I'm concerned. They are fair game to be laughed at because, you know, although I don't really like to be judgmental about individuals, those who impose themselves above us, you know, if they're not using power responsibly, then, you know, it affects us directly. And so they need to be satirized because that's just the way it is, you know? And that is the world I was told I was free to grow up in. So, you know, I'm just going with that, right? <laughs> I shall leave it at that. See you later, alligator. See you soon, baboon. If you like this content, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. And while you're at it, check out all our social media links. Please help this channel grow. Your help will be appreciated.